Welcome to Scam Squad. I'm here again with Deputy District Attorney Vicki Johnson, who always has great information and warnings for us. And she's going to introduce our guest, one of our very favorite guests. Absolutely. We're happy to welcome back Judy Crispin Yates, a criminologist. And as you know, Judy puts out a monthly newsletter full of the latest information that we need to have about frauds uh, targeting all of us. I used to say targeting seniors, which of course includes me, but it's really a lot uh, broader than that. And, um, you know, she's, she's just full of valuable information to share with us. One item in particular from the newsletter caught my eye because it's a problem we're having here in Santa Barbara, as well as all across the country. I've talked about it before, but Judy's gonna provide us with some more specific information. And that is crooks stealing victim's identity and then filing unemployment claims. So welcome, Judy. And the first question I have for you is, how can somebody do this? How can somebody file for unemployment in someone else's name? Well, thank you, Vicki and Patty, for having me back on Scam Squad. Um, I would like to re uh, remind all the listeners and the viewers that what I'm sharing is just general information from research and experience that I've had with victims. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, a point that I want people to go out and do their homework and learn more about this. And for any legal issues, then you need to consult a lawyer or a financial a professional. And unfortunately, a lot of these financial scams uh, come down to physical, mental, and emotional um, problems. And in that case, you need to consult a medical doctor. So, Thank you. Yes. And so uh, to answer your question, Vicki, uh, to commit to commit unemployment uh, claims fraud, first the um, crook needs to get a hold of your social security number and your name. And the ways that they do that is they steal your mail, go dumpster diving, uh, medical records have the information as well as credit reports and tax records. They can actually buy this information on the dark web. Um, it doesn't even cost that much, it's really sad. Also, there are data breaches for companies uh, that have your personal information, and you can't do anything about that. If you have been involved in a data breach or your information has been involved, then that company is required in uh, a very near future from discovering that to let you know that um, by mail that you have been a victim. But also um, the information's available oftentimes in your home, your financial statements are lying around, somebody steals your purse or wallet. So that's really the hard part, um, you know, for the scammer uh, to go ahead and get this. Um, once the crook has that personal information, the social security number, all they have to do is fill out a form and file it, that's it. So they don't have a lot of work that is involved in filing for this. And it turns out that the US Department of Labor's Inspector General just reported this last February that at least $5.4 billion of unemployment claims are fraudulent. So the scammers have been very, very busy. Oh my goodness, that is, that is overwhelming. How would I know if somebody has applied for benefits in mining? Well, I guess the first question I would ask is, is there anything I can do about it? And the answer is no, not in advance. There's nothing you can do about it. That just sounds weird, but that's the way it is. But, you know, so that's the short answer. Um, but, okay, Vicki, let's see. I don't think that's your next question. You, I, I, I've got this written, so um, we, you're gonna have to audit that or delete that. Okay. Um, so let me go to, you ask me, we have done number, so I think our three, does a person, your question is, does a person have to pay taxes on unemployment benefits? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so and, you answered my question, how would I know if someone applied benefit for benefits? No, after that, it's what agencies do I contact? And then... No, I know, but, but the next question that I wanted answered was, how would I know if somebody had applied for benefits in my name? Okay. How, how would I know that? All right, so let me see where I put that. All right.
right? So I actually put that. That is really very weird. I, I obviously that was an important. Uh, I see. I got it out of. Uh, Do you have the answer in your head, Judy? I'm sorry. Do you know the answer in your head? Um, do I know the uh, 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 I had such a flow. <laughs> you did, you did, definitely did. Yeah, 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 didn't yeah. mean, to, didn't mean right. to throw you for a loop. Oh, yes, here we go. Um, I've got that as number six. Okay, so how, okay. how would, um, all right. So what was the question? How would I know if somebody applied for benefits in my name? Um, well, you might be getting um, a, a IRS Form 1099-G that um, is a report on any benefits that you would not normally get. And if that shows up and you don't know what they're talking about, that certainly is a problem. Uh, it's possible that a government agency might um, uh, ask you about unemployment claims that you've submitted. And if you haven't, of course, that's a red flag. And heaven forbid, if you get something that says that this is coming from another state, that's definitely a red flag. And um, also it's just po very possible that uh, your employer, if you're currently working, will get a phone call and um, the person on the other end of the phone will go, you know, well, this, this person has applied for benefits. Well, the employer knows you're working. So another red flag. So you need to check on that. Okay, thank you. Now, does a person have to pay taxes if they get unemployment benefits? Do you pay taxes on the benefits? And, and what if you never actually receive the benefits? What happens then? Well, Vicki, the good news and the short answer is no, you don't have okay. to pay. The more complex issue is what do you do next? So it's recommended that you file reports with four different agencies. And if you're only going to do one, I want you to make sure that you do that with the IRS. Okay. So IRS.gov, and you can uh, look up the identity theft fraud scams uh, on unemployment benefits, and it'll bring you up to the appropriate page. Uh, the other one that's recommended is the Federal Trade Commission. And remember the FTC.gov, okay, you're going to hear that a lot from me. Um, in 1998, there was the Identity Theft and Assumption Deterrence Act that was created and the Federal Trade Commission became the go-to place that collects all the information on financial uh, crimes for all different states. And they're putting, they have all kinds of information. It's a great, ftc.gov is a great site to go visit and it has lots of information. And also they have a responsibility of uh, educating consumers. So that would be number two. Number three, it's recommended that you file with IC3.gov. Um, that is the Internet Crime Complaint Center. The FBI operates that. And, and anything that, any crime that happens using your uh, computer uh, on internet, then it's really best if you file with IC3.gov in addition to FTC.gov. The fourth one, which is new to me, um, is the United States Department of Justice's National Center for Disaster Fraud. And mm. I had to look up and see what that really meant. And it means that this uh, website allows you to submit complaints of fraud, waste and abuse or mismanagement related to any man-made or national, uh, nat natural disaster to include criminal activity re related to COVID-19. So, but if you're only going to do one, make sure it's irs.gov. Okay, perfect. Now, what should I do about the theft of my identity? Because obviously, if somebody is applying for unemployment benefits in my name, they have stolen my identity. What well, kind of things do I need to do? I would recommend that you start with ftc.gov, Federal Trade Commission. Uh, they actually have a pamphlet on there that you can print out on exactly what to do with phone numbers and all. But what it says in there is that you need to check with all three of the credit bureaus. That's TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. I recommend that you get all of your uh, credit reports. I'm hoping, mm -hmm. hopefully you're doing that regularly anyway, <clears throat> so that you can see if anything's happening. 
um, on your credit reports. Additionally, I certainly recommend that you have alerts or especially freezes. And a freeze, if you freeze a credit report, uh, you would have to go to each of the three um, credit reporting agencies separately, and it will affect nothing that is currently in place. It only impacts you getting future credit, and all they do is they give you a PIN number. It's really a second verification to open an account. I highly recommend it. I do that. So, you know, uh, definitely check on that one. There is uh, credit monitoring, and there are places that uh, charge five, 10, 15, 20, and more dollars a month to monitor your, your credit. However, uh, most of those things that they do are free to you. You don't have to pay for that. You can get your credit reports for free. You can freeze your credit for free, get alerts. Um, and there are other places like Auto Club, your, some of the insurance companies, they uh, provide free monitoring for you. Some of the financial institutions do as well. And um, so check with that and uh, see if you have that for free. But I do tell people, if you are gonna do nothing, totally ignore everything that's going on and you have money to throw out there, then get credit monitoring. You're gonna have to provide them with a lot of information. You're gonna do the work anyway, but that's your prerogative to spend your money doing that. And it's certainly better than doing nothing. Now, if, you, if you're suspicious that somebody has stolen your identity because you get wind of the fact that they're collecting benefits in your name, should you also talk to your bank and see if you need to change your bank account or talk to your credit card companies and perhaps stop those accounts? Oh, for sure. You know, if you are communicating with anybody online, uh, internet, texting, messaging, on the telephone, and they've asked for information and you've just given it away, that's the first place you need to, to call when you get off the phone. Um, also uh, file a local police report. Your financial institutions are going to want that. Uh, they want to, to understand that, you know, you really mean business in this, that something has really happened. Um, the best thing to do is do not talk to people that just call at random that you don't know. Patty, did you have something to ask? I, I do have a question about freezing your credit and you mentioned the PIN. Are you saying that you should keep your credit frozen most of the time and only when you're going to get a loan or you know that somebody's going to be checking it, you use your PIN to unfreeze it? That is highly recommend that, uh, recommended that you freeze it for all of the time. This mm -hmm. is just one more time that you need more verification than what the credit... Uh, agencies provide you. So you keep it, you keep it frozen. And that way, if anybody is trying to set up any account in your name, you're going to get a call because they need that pin number. So boom, you know that somebody is out there after your information. It really isn't an inconvenience. It, the only inconvenience it would be is that you have one more number, uh, pin number to remember. And each of the credit agencies you have to do them one at a time and they will each give you a separate PIN number. But uh, it turns out that all of us, uh, uh, the citizens have you know, a social security number and we have, uh, it, you know, it's just possible that somebody can get that information and affect our credit because you use a social security number oftentimes to um, you know, be able to add things and buy things. So, you know, freeze the kids. Parents have the opportunity to do that to the age of 17. And so they can do all of their children's. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't think about that, but our information is out there. So yes, I definitely- oh, I didn't realize that. So thank you for that wonderful tip. That's really good to know. And it doesn't affect your score, so to speak. Your score could still go up and down. It just freezes it for- Okay. In the long run, it's going to help because People can't be stealing, Okay, cool. adding to your score. Mm -hmm. So I want to move on to something that's just kind of fun, but also pretty educational, I thought. Um, in your financial newsletter, you talk about the glitter bomb trap. And um, that is a great video that I have watched a couple of times. Could you just tell us what that is and uh, then how we can access it? how our listeners can find it because it's really a fun video to watch. 
Well, on YouTube, there is a video called Glitter Bomb Trap Catches Phone Scammer. It's exactly 23 minutes and 14 seconds. That, that way you know what you're, you know, that you have the right one. Uh, the creator is Mark Rober, R-O-B-E-R. -E and as of yesterday, that video had more than 32 million views. <laughs> That's how popular it, it happens to be. Yeah. Um, I really like this video because it describes and shows you how scammers operate. It includes using money mules and, and talks about the scammer business hierarchies. Um, one scammer actually in the video uses an Airbnb as a money drop for a money mule to go and pick up the money. And um, the video shows drama of the victims that, I mean, it's really sad in some places. Um, there's cooperation of the police in trying to catch these scammers. Uh, the scammers are shown trying to charm their way out of being suspects and even more. And there's uh, the glitter bomb is actually something that uh, Mark developed, he created, he is an engineer. I call him a good guy engineer. I, I don't know him, I've only seen this video, but I like what he's put out there. But he has created a glitter bomb that he will put in a box and it gets sent to the scammer instead of the victim sending their money. He has to obviously have cooperation <laughs> with the victim. And so then what happens even with money mules, money mules can be victims, but they can also be uh, perpetrators or scammers themselves. And so, um, what the supervisors of the scam do is they have the money mules open uh, the package because they're trying to create distance between any crime that's occurring. So what you see is uh, a money mule opens this and this glitter bomb bursts and you know it, it is not harmful whatsoever, but it's so messy. There is glitter all over these people. And if you've ever used any glitter whatsoever, it is really hard to get rid of and you don't get rid of it right away. And so <laughs> you will see, uh, actually um, the police will stop the money mule that they've been following and she gets out and plays, oh, you know, I, just poor me, I, I don't know. And they go, well, what is, what's all that all over you? Oh, I don't know. And so it's really, I watched it a couple of times myself and that is a long video for me to even bother to watch, but 23 minutes, 14 seconds, the glitter bomb trap catches phone scam scammer by Mark Robar. Yeah, I really recommend watching that. And I, I thank you for referencing that in your newsletter. And I, I think we're going to call that our good news for the day. It is good <laughs> news. All that glitter all over. <laughs> <laughs> because we were able to watch, if you watch it, you can watch it real time. Money mules getting caught and um, the ultimate crooks getting stymied in their attempts to have money delivered to them through their intermediaries. So that's some good news for us today, Judy. And thank you so much for being a part of the show again. Thank and we you. really look forward to your next newsletter. We do. You come up with some good things, Judy. We really enjoy it. Thank you. Everybody stay vi uh, vigilant. Everybody stay vigilant. We shall. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.